sorry, my video just like hiccuped and I looked really scary for a sec. Um, all right, beginning of our lectures on community ecology and honestly, quite honestly, this actually is gonna be um, separate, okay? So we're gonna move that down and then what we're gonna stick in between the two is ecosystem ecology. Okay, so once again, I'm gonna to try to break this up into smaller chunks. So we're gonna have um, three different videos this week about um, several different topics, right? Within, um, within the realm of community ecology. Um, I think community ecology is, even, even though ecology is my favorite area of biology, community ecology is my favorite type of ecology. Okay, so anyway, so let's start. Let's, it's an adorable picture of a bird. We'll talk about why that bird is there later, okay? Um, but let's jump in. So why is, why is community ecology important? Why is this something we care about? So um, maybe first we should define it, right? So um, I'm gonna let you think for a second about what a community is. So how is a community different from a population? Make sure you're really clear with that, right? So a population is a group of individuals that are all the same species that interact with each other. A community is a group of different species that interact with each other, okay? And so really what I'm representing here with this picture is not just community ecology, but also ecosystem ecology as well. Um, and so community ecology deals with how different species interact, all kinds of different interactions between different species. And so that's what we're going to be exploring this week. Um, why do you care? Uh, so some of the things we're going to talk about are things that, are, you know, have a direct impact on you. So um, there's a picture of fish there. The reason we're looking at a picture of, um, those are tuna. Um, the reason we're looking at a picture of fish is um, one really interesting kind of phenomenon that we might learn about in community ecology is talking about something called biological magnification, which is the tendency for certain chemicals to build up in certain kinds of food. So if you've ever heard that certain types of fish have very high levels of mercury in them, that's a community ecology topic, right? So we'll talk about it. Um, we're next to the fish. You're looking at a couple burgers. One of them is a veggie burger and one of them is a beef burger. Um, and so food choices, right? It, it, that's all community ecology too, right? Thinking about what kinds of um, foods you choose to eat, animals, plants, fungi, whatever, protists. Yeah, you even eat a bunch of prokaryotes too, whether you like to think about that or not. So um, what are the ecological ramifications of what you eat, right? So that's a really kind of interesting, um, interesting thing to think about. Okay, um, so that's community ecology. Um, using, so the picture of the ladybugs, flying ladybugs, I don't know if you've ever seen a ladybug f like in flight like that before, it's pretty impressive. Um, but we're looking at ladybugs there and they are about to eat aphids. So in our last um, series, right? One of the things we talked about were aphids. So these are the little aphids right here, these little guys, right? And they're sucking the juice out of that plant and the ladybugs are going to come and eat them. And so um, if you go during the right time of year, sometimes at the hardware store, or whatever store you go to that has like a nursery where they sell plants and stuff, sometimes they sell ladybugs in little, you know, plastic containers. Um, and the reason that people um, buy them is because they're trying to get ladybugs to live in their yard because ladybugs are predators that very much enjoy eating pest insects like aphids especially. Um, and so people release ladybugs in their yard to try to get them to take care of their aphid problem, right? Um, so we're gonna talk about predation relationships, yeah? And how sometimes we can use them to our advantage. Okay, so that's another reason why you should care. Um, and then the last picture there is a picture of um, Europe. I don't know how well you can see this, but this is France. I can tell because of the face. France has a face. I'm really good at geography, right? There's Portugal, there's Spain. Anyway, right? And so we're seeing a, a good little storm there 
um, off to the side, right? And so not so much community ecology, more ecosystem ecology is um, thinking about um, climate patterns um, and how the climate is changing. And that's another thing that directly affects all of you, directly. Okay, in a variety of different ways. Okay, so um, community ecology and ecosystem ecology are a couple of really, I, I hope you find them to be somewhat interesting um, topics for a variety of reasons. Okay, so what are we, well, I already reviewed what a community is, right? Remember, it's all, all of the different species that interact with each other. So here we're looking at, you know, a scene from the savanna um, in Africa. So there's a, um, female lion who is looks like she's trying to defend her kill right from vultures and a hyena right and so what are all the different interactions that we're seeing here well we're seeing an interaction between the lion as she competes with the hyena and the vultures so we're seeing competition that's one interaction we're also seeing a predator prey relationship between the lion and the zebra so predator prey situation. We're also seeing um, a relationship, I mean, not anymore because the zebra's dead, but <laughs> the zebra probably was grazing on all of those little plants, the grass and the other plants on the ground, right? Before it met its demise. Um, so that's another relationship too, right? And so all of these different relationships between all of these different organisms, that's community ecology. So those are some of the different things we're gonna talk about, okay? Before we talk about anything else in community ecology, one nice place to start is to talk about biodiversity and just sort of define what it means um, and understand the different ways that we can think about it. Okay, so if you look at these two images, Woodland A and Woodland B, and I said to you, so biodiversity just means diversity of life, as you might expect. So if I look, if you look at those and I said, which of these communities, Woodland A or Woodland B, which of them is more diverse, right? I would assume that you would all say, well, Wood Woodland B is obviously, okay? So then I might ask you, okay, cool. How many different species are there in each woodland, okay? So biodiversity, right? Number of species. Okay, so let's count them, all right? So we've got the dark skinny tree, that's one species. We've got the light skinny tree, that's number two. We got the kind of blue green pointy one, that's three. And then we got the medium green bushy one, that's four different species that I see there. Okay, that should be a C, not an E, anyway, whatever. Okay, what are we looking at in Woodland B? How many different species do we have? Okay, well, we got the, got the dark pointy, we got the light pointy, we got the blue green, we got the bushy. Crap. It appears as though this one also has four species. And yet, your answer that woodland bee is more diverse is still true. Right? So biodiversity isn't just about the number of species. That's one component, right? But also relative abundance. So what does that mean? Relative abundance just means relative to one another, how common are certain species, right? So in Woodland B, there's one, two, three, four, five of those pointy ones, one, two, three, four, five of those pointy ones, one, two, three, four, five of those pointy ones, and one, two, three, four, five of the bushy ones. So they are equally abundant, relatively speaking. Whereas in Woodland A, there's only two of these, there's only one of those, there's only one of those, and then there's a whole bunch of the other ones. So they are not as even, yeah? Okay, so biodiversity, right, means not just for, for a area to have high biodiversity, it does, it's not just about the number of species, but also the relative abundance is a factor as well, okay? 
Now there, so there's a little chart that illustrates my point. Okay. All right. Um, so what is biodiversity? Uh, most of the time when you, we think about biodiversity, what you're thinking about is you're thinking about the number of species, right? So you're thinking about, oh, this community or this ecosystem, how many different species does it include? Okay. Um, but there are other sort of um, levels at which you could talk about biodiversity. So you could talk about biodiversity by thinking about like habitats, right? So they're showing you a picture of most of South America there. So the idea is you might say that there's a tremendous amount of biodiversity in South America because there are so many different types of ecosystems. There are so many different types of habitats there, right? So types of ecosystems could be another one, right? Um, or you could go, so that's bigger than species, or you could go smaller and you could look at um, genetic variation, right? So you could be talking about biodiversity of the genes in a single population of some animal or some plant, right? So most of the time when we talk about biodiversity, this is what we're talking about, okay? But it, it can be other things as well, okay? Just so you know, all right? Okay, so where we're going next, the first sort of big interaction that we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about competition. Before we talk about competition, we have a term that we need to define. So depending on where you've learned that word before, um, the term is niche. Some people say niche. Those people are trying to sound fancy, which is fine. So my husband teaches English. I think I've mentioned this before. Um, and he always says niche. And I'm like, that's not how biologists say it. We say niche, okay? Um, and this is another one of those words that means something specific in science, and it kind of means something sort of different in, like, everyday language, right? So so niche mean, you know, like, in, in a general language can mean, a, like, a little location, like a little spot where something is, right? A niche. Um, or it can mean something like, oh, it's this is your, you found your, your calling, what you're meant to do in life. It's your, it's your niche whatever. I don't know. I don't teach that stuff. <laughs> okay. Um, what it means in ecology is something pretty specific. Okay. So a lot of people think that it's only about physical space. So they hear the term niche and they think, oh, we're talking about where an organism lives. That is certainly part of it. Okay. But it's not just that, right? So in this example, we're looking at a, a bald eagle in, in a nest. I don't know if it's male or female, but that's okay, right? So we're looking at a bald eagle sitting in a nest. Um, and so you might think, well, you know, the bald eagle's niche is it lives in certain types of trees and it lives in certain areas, right? So, you know, most of North America, not sort of the very bottom of Mexico, but most of North America has, um, has bald eagles in it, okay? Um, at least at some point in, you know, in the year, okay? So, yeah, all right, so that's one part of the niche is where they live, but it's not just that, right? It's also the type of food that they use. It's also when they reproduce. It's also all of the different requirements for, you know, where they can live. So their temperature or moisture requirements or other necessary living conditions, right? So the way that I like to think about niche, kind of a shorthand way of thinking about it, is an organism's niche is its home plus its job, right? So not just where it lives, but what role it plays in that habitat. Yeah? So where it lives and role it plays. Okay, I just thought of a good idea for an assignment. I feel like I should, maybe I'll do, maybe I'll do this next week. Make you describe your niche. What's your niche? If there was an alien, I like aliens. There was an alien studying humans. 
right? How would they describe the niche of a human? That's interesting. Hmm. It's, it's kind of a creative idea. I might do that. Anyway, okay, so that's what a niche is, all right? So you need to know what a niche is in order to understand the topics that we're kind of moving into. Okay, so before we full on get into competition, okay, um, before we get into the competitive exclusion principle, we need to talk about what competition is. So I actually am going to see if I can pop in. Can I just do like a, there we go. That's what I'm going to do. See, I'm smart. Sometimes it occurs to me that I can make a white screen just to pop from nowhere. Okay, so you know what competition is, right? Competition is when different species or individuals need the same resources, right? And so they compete for them, all right? Um, there are two types, okay? There are two types of competition. One type is called intraspecific competition okay another type is called in ter specific competition okay let's talk about what they, they sound like the same thing but they're not okay so specific means species in this case right? So the difference in these is that um, prefix in the front of the word. So intra means within and inter means between, okay? So let me give you my classic goofy example, all right? We, he has long since passed on but uh, my husband and I, our first dog that we had together was a beagle named Darwin. You can imagine why, I hope. I hope you remember enough about Darwin to know why that's significant. If not, maybe think about it for a minute, okay? My husband wanted a beagle and I said, well, as a biologist, if we get a beagle, I, we have to name him Darwin. And so we did. Darwin was a ridiculous dog. Um, one of his little quirks that was very charming is he was obsessed with pizza. Now he liked all food because he was a beagle and beagles are like that, but he like, it, it, he could tell like when a delivery driver was like driving down the road, like he loved pizza more than I've ever seen anybody love anything. Okay. Um, so let's get to my example. So we buy some pizza, right? We have some pizza delivered. Okay. Now, if Darwin was outside in the backyard while we ate the pizza, right? And, you know, we're eating the pizza and then it's, you know, we didn't get a very big pizza. There's only like two slices left. There's four of us and we're going to start fighting over the pizza, right? Since we are all within the same species, me and the husband and the kiddos, what kind of competition would that be? right? So me, hubs, kids fighting for the last slice of pizza, that's intraspecific competition because we are all members of the same species, right? So within our species, we're competing. Okay. What if somebody lets Darwin inside? If somebody lets Darwin in, then guess what? Suddenly it's interspecific competition <laughs> because now Darwin is like, let me get at that. I'm going to get it. If it's on your plate, I don't care. I'm going to take it off, right? He'll knock over a child for some pizza. He would anyway. It was kind of good that he was old by the time the kids came along because he was a little too old to knock them over. But in his young, younger days, he would take a kid out to take their pizza. Just like he would just, anyway. So that's interspecific, right? Because now it's competition between two different species. All right. So one other thing I want you to think about is I want you to think about which of these is, are these both topics within community ecology or are they topics within population ecology? That's a good question. So intraspecific within species, this is really something that affects populations, right? So that's a population ecology type of question, 
right? Whereas this, since we're talking about multiple different species and how they interact, this is a community ecology question. Okay, so that's what we're talking about now. We are talking in this chapter, in this chapter, it's all the same chapter. In this section this week, we're talking about um, interspecific competition rather than intraspecific. That was last time. Okay. All right. Okay. So let's look at, uh, let's look at a uh, slide here. Okay. So competitive exclusion principle. Um, this is a little bit tricky to understand. Um, but I, you know, we'll see how it goes. Okay. So, um, this is a classic experiment by a guy named Gauss. You don't need to know that. We don't care. But basically, he wanted to know if you have two different species that are very, very similar to each other, will they cohabitate? And right, and what will happen? Okay, so what he did is he found two species of paramecia. So these are our two little species of paramecia. Um, paramecia are unicellular little um, eukaryotes. They're eukaryotes, right? But they're unicellular and they have cilia. I don't know if you can see the cilia on the outside of their body that they use to swim. And we'll talk about cilia later when we get to cells. Um, these guys live in ponds, right? So they live in, you know, all kinds of aquatic environments. There's lots of different species of paramecia. So these are two different species. They're very, very similar. In what ways are they similar, you might ask? They are very similar in where they live. They are very similar in what they do. They are very similar in when they reproduce and how they reproduce and the type of food that they use. And do you see where I'm going with this? Okay. So essentially, they have a very similar niche. Okay. All right. So what Gauss did is he had these two different species of paramecia and he grew them in separate cultures. So what is a culture? A culture is basically you have like a, a flask or, you know, whatever, some sort of containment device, an aquarium, I don't know, right, with water and food and then you grow your critters in there, okay? So he grew in one flask, he was growing paramecium aurelia, right? That's the one in, that's represented by the red line. In the other flask, he was growing paramecium caudatum, right? Similar, they're both, they're in the same genus, but they're different species, okay? So when he grew them in separate flasks, right? If he started with one at, you know, time zero, right? And this doesn't have any units on it because it's just relative, but whatever, right? So at first we have sort of slow growth happening here. And then it gets sort of steep and then it sort of levels off. What kind of growth is that? We talked about this last week. What kind of population growth is that? It's logistic growth. Right? So it's logistic growth, right? It starts off a little slow and then it kind of picks up, but then it eventually levels off at a level that we call the carrying capacity. Okay, um, so that is what the populations look like when you grow them separately. So each one has their own flask. Okay, so the question that he asked is, if I put them in a flask together, right, what's going to happen? Are they going to, are each po is each population going to grow until they're about equal? What's going to happen, right? So he did that a whole bunch of times. <laughs> And every time he did it, every time he started with one of each species in a combined culture, so in a flask together, right, so one of each critter, yeah, what happened was for the first few days, right, so for the first few days, both populations started to grow, right? Eh, around day five and six, right, things started to change, yeah, so Aurelia kept growing. The population kept going up, ultimately a little slower than by itself, right? But it ultimately leveled off pretty close to its normal carrying capacity. What happened to caudatum? So in the first four days, the population's going up and then, and they 
died. Ultimately, they went extinct, right? Locally extinct. I don't mean every single one around the whole world died, right? But just in that container, they went extinct, right? So every single time he did it, it always turned out the same way, right? Aurelia always grew until it reached its carrying capacity, right? The population grew until it reached carrying capacity. Caudatum started to grow, but after a little while, just <laughs> nosedive, and then the population disappeared of caudatum. So what was happening? Why would that happen? Why would that happen? Why would they start growing together at first, right? Both are, you know, their population increases. But then after a while, it goes, you know, each one goes down a different path. Why would that happen? All right. So in the beginning, there was so much space and so many resources that they weren't competing with each other, right? It was just like a whole new world, plenty of territory, but not territory, but, you know, plenty of spaces to live, plenty of food, you know, they're, they're not competing at all. But as soon as the populations became dense enough that they started to run into each other, they started to compete, clearly one of them was better, <laughs> right? Clearly one of them was a better competitor. So which one was the better competitor? Paramecium aurelia is a better competitor. And so every time Paramecium aurelia would basically kick Paramecium caudatum's butt, right? Um, and make it make them die eventually, right? Because Paramecium aurelia is a better competitor, okay? So what does it all mean? So this is called the competitive exclusion principle, okay? And so the competitive exclusion principle is the idea that, I might as well write this down now that I remember. It's like I've already, I've always known there's a white screen. I don't know why I forget all the time. I'm a bonehead, that's why. Okay, so the competitive exclusion principle, states that when two species share an identical niche, one species will be the victor and survive, and the other one will go extinct, okay? That's what, that's what Gauss's point was, okay? So when two species share an identical niche, the better competitor survives and the weaker dies. Okay, that's the competitive exclusion principle. Sweet, seems really straightforward. It's not though, as it turns out, okay? So here's another example. So this is a test of the competitive exclusion principle. And so this is another test. We're not going to use the names of these barnacles because they're really hard to say. <laughs> okay. Um, but the idea is that somebody wanted to see, all right, well, what happens when we, you know, with other species, let's test out this concept, right? Let's test out the competitive exclusion principle with other species and see what happens. So, right. What they did is um, they manipulated barnacle populations. And so what barnacles are, barnacles are um, tiny little crustaceans. They're like, they're kind of like crabs, but they don't have heads. They're weird, okay? But they're these tiny little crustaceans that live inside of a little shell that is stuck onto a surface, right? So they move around when they're young right? When they're, you know, floating around in the water. But as adults, they like stick onto something and that's where they stay, right? And they get larger, right? But they, they don't ever leave that surface, okay? So what they did, right? What researchers did is they wanted to know, so they saw that in this particular habitat, the 
we're, they're not actually brown and blue. We're just using those colors as examples, okay? So they're not literally brown and blue um, barnacles, okay? All right, so what they did is they wanted to know if you remove one species, what happens to the other one, okay? So if they killed, like pulled off, pried off all the brown species from the upper part of the intertidal, okay? Would the blue ones grow higher, right? So they did that in one study area. In another study area, they ripped all the blue barnacles off and wanted to see whether or not the brown barnacles moved down, okay? Sounds straightforward enough. Let's find out what they found out, okay? So something you need to know about intertidal areas. So if you've ever spent any much time in the water, in our lovely oceans, um, uh, there is, the water level varies at different times, right? And so because of the, the pull from the gravity of the moon, right? Um, the ocean level can be, really high or really low and it alternates over the course of it alternates twice over the course of every day okay so high tide is when the water is the highest low tide is when the water is the lowest and so tide is either coming in meaning the tide is getting higher and higher and higher or the tide is going out meaning it's getting lower and lower and lower and lower okay so if you ever visit any tide pools at, say, Dana Point or Doheny State Beach or any, you know, other places around here where you can go visit tide pools, um, you want to go at low tide because you'll be able to see more stuff because the water is lower, right? If you come at high tide, you're not going to see anything because the water's covering everything, okay? So that's the difference between high and low tide. So they have marked here where the high tide is and the low tide is. Now, why does it matter for these critters? Well, the closer you are to the low tide line, the more time you spend underwater over the course of the day. The closer you are to the high tide line, the less time you spend underwater, right? Because as soon as the water hits high tide, it immediately starts going back down towards low tide, right? So there's a lot more exposure to air up here, and there's a lot more exposure to water down there if you get the you know the gist okay so that's worth knowing so what were the results of these studies what did they find out well what they found out is what was the first one that i said they removed the brown guys when they removed the brown guys the blue guys did not move up there it didn't happen right so clearly the blue guys are not interested or capable in living up there okay do you think the same happened the other way so in the other study remember they removed the blue ones and they wanted to see if the brown ones would move down guess what they did they did move okay so what does this tell us about competition that's interesting okay so this tells you uh, sort of an alternate thing that can happen with the competitive exclusion principle, okay? So two species of barnacles, they, have, they eat the similar kinds of food. Their niches are very similar, okay? They're not identical though. And the reason that they're not identical is that different species have different tolerance for how much water they can survive in, right? So the blue barnacles, the reason that they don't move up here if there's no competition is because they can't live in a place that's that dry. They are not well suited to live in a super dry environment. So they can't, they don't have that option, right? But the brown ones, I mean, that's better. That's like better real estate. If you can move to a better neighborhood, you do move to a better neighborhood, right? Okay, so they can move down there, right? Because it's covered with more water, it's better. They're filter feeders, right? They get their food out of the water, right? They're aquatic organisms. So it's better to live in the water, 
okay? So what's interesting though, is that when these two species are together, the blue barnacles block the brown ones from moving down into their neighborhood, right? And they do that because they're a better competitor, yeah? So when they are in the same place, the competitive exclusion principle is active, right? When these two species are in the same place, this guy wins, right? But because this guy has a higher tolerance for being dry, its niche has shifted a little bit so that it can live in a slightly drier habitat than the blue one can which is what allows it to survive. Otherwise it would get outcompeted every time and it would die. Yeah, so natural selection has driven the brown barnacles, right? Natural selection has, you know, caused them to develop a little bit better tolerance of getting dry, right? A little bit, you know, better tolerance of not eating as much. Yeah, but the trade-off is they get, you know, they get to live because these guys, kick their butts if they're trying to grow together, okay? And so that is another outcome of competition, okay? So this is not the competitive exclusion principle, right? This phenomenon that we're describing here is called resource partitioning. Right. And so what that means is that the weaker competitor shifts its niche to avoid the better competitor. That's an H. Okay, so here's another example of resource purchasing. So it, you see this all over nature as it turns out, right? There's ton, I could, I could give you a million examples, okay? Um, here's one, okay? So here's another example. So we got our barnacles, right? So it, it, as it turns out, competitive exclusion principle didn't happen, right? Because neither one of them went extinct completely, right? But one of them shifted its niche. So it did some fancy resource partitioning, right? That's what the brown barnacles did, okay? So here's another example. So these little lizards um, are called anolis lizards, and they are found in the um, Caribbean. And um, some species are used a lot in the pet trade because they have these cute little, they call them a dewlap. It's this cute little thing on their neck that are brightly colored. Um, and they're just small, and they're they're cute. So, you know, some people keep them as pets. Um, but they're, they, you know, are native to um, various islands in the Caribbean. And what's really, really interesting is you can have three or four different species of anolis lizards. They're all in the same genus, right? In one tree. Yeah. And it's like, well, but I thought if they were, if they, right, they eat the same stuff, mostly. They have the same kind of lifestyle. They live, they all live in trees. They eat the same kind of food, right? So how is that possible? that we could have four very similar species all living in one tree. It's possible as a result of resource partitioning. So one species specializes, Ricordii, that's how you would say that, okay? Specializes in living up in the high part of the tree, right? Um, Ethrygii specializes in being much closer to the ground, right? Christophii, kind of a mid-level, right? Some species even specialize in living on fences, right? So they have essentially made their niche much more specific, right? Very specific niche. Right? And what that does is it prevents them from competing with one another. 
by having a very narrow, very specific niche. I live up in the tops of trees. I live in the middle of trees. I live at the ground. We're not going to compete with each other. Yeah? That's resource partitioning. Okay? So, in summary, when competitors have identical niches, when niches overlap, when niches overlap, why is my, why is, why? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Sorry. It's, it's slide change on me. When niches overlap, right? One of two things happens. Either competitive exclusion. One's a winner, one dies. Or resource partitioning. So they separate or narrow their niches. They're not competing with each other. So the way that this is represented in this picture is, right, if we're talking about paramecia again, is these guys specialize in living up higher and these guys specialize in living lower. Okay, so that's competition and the niche, all right? Um, oftentimes, this results, resource partitioning results in something called character displacement. Um, it's, character displacement is, what do I want to say? Character displacement is the result of resource partitioning. They're kind of the same thing, right? But the idea is that, um, when you have, when competition occurs, right, um, and resource partitioning occurs, it typically results in characteristics being different. I know that sounded like totally cyclical. I don't, I'm trying to think of another way to say that, right? So um, maybe I can't. So maybe we'll just look at this picture and look at this example, okay? So let's say we have two, oh, look, it's our Galapagos finches again, right? So we got finches that live on two different islands. And those two species of finches on their separate islands can eat all different kinds of seeds, little small skinny seeds, big fat seeds. They can both eat both, okay? But if both of those species end up on a shared island where they might compete against one another, right? natural selection favors them to become more specialized, right? So one species, the selective pressure of natural selection, right, makes them get bigger and bigger beaks. And so they end up eating the hard seeds, the big tough seeds, right? And these guys get smaller and smaller beaks because it's a lot easier to manipulate a teeny tiny seed if you have a teeny tiny little delicate beak. Yeah, so character displacement. So the beak of this guy gets smaller between this island and this island. The beak of this guy, right, gets bigger between this island and this island. So character displacement is a result of resource partitioning. They, they go together, if that makes sense. If not, come to my Zoom. And we can talk about it, okay? So that's competition. That's where I'm gonna stop this particular video. So our next topic is going to be about a bunch of different symbiotic relationships as well as predator-prey relationships. Cool. Why can't I find my stop? See, you guys, you know, you'd think I'd be getting better at videos by now. But no, I'm not. Definitely not.